Um, anyways, welcome everyone to our first uh, student advisory meeting of the 2021 20, uh, school year. I know that many of you all um, we have met before. Uh, welcome back to our nine or 10 students that joined are joining us from the previous year. Um, Donna Melton and myself have met most of you all uh, through virtual um, interviews. I am Tony Kahn's Tatman, the interim communications director for the Department of Education. Very excited to see you all today. Um, I will go ahead and introduce our interim commissioner, Kevin uh, C. Brown, and he will just give you a short introduction and hello, Kevin. Good morning. Thank, thank all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're excited to have returning members, but also a great group of new student advisory council members. Uh, this is my favorite advisory council that I've had to, I've been able to work with during the interim period as uh, most of you know I've been serving as the interim commissioner since December in between permanent commissioners and uh, we uh, the state board has now selected a new commissioner Dr. Jason Glass he's with us today and excited that he can be with us even though he is still with his uh, uh, district there in uh, Colorado he's been able to devote some time before he arrives permanently in September so I really want to thank him and I'm already enjoying working with him and you are really Really going to enjoy uh, working with him. He, as you may already know, he is originally from Kentucky, taught in Kentucky, but it's also been has, has some amazing experiences in other states that he'll tell you about, and we are lucky to have him come home. Uh, the Student Advisory Council was the first advisory council that we brought back to advise me in my interim role in the department when the pandemic hit in March. And so I hope you understand that we don't just have this advisory as window dressing. Uh, this is an acting, an active, a real advisory uh, uh, group and I know Dr. Glass will continue that tradition and I know he will just from my conversations with him already he believes in student voice and we ask you the same questions and you will uh, maybe not today because today's more of a is in an introductory session but as you continue to have meetings you'll hear from department staff uh, with the same issues that we present to the superintendent advisory the teacher advisory and all the other advisories uh, you are the customers and the students, and uh, we need to hear from you to make the best decisions possible. Um, I'll be returning back to Jefferson County Schools as their general counsel, as their lead lawyer when Dr. Glass arrives, and so I'll still be involved. I'll be watching from afar. I know we have some Jefferson County students in, involved in the advisory, so uh, since I'm a short timer, I don't want to take any more time up Tony and Dr. Glass, and I'm excited for Dr. Glass to get to know the students. So uh, Dr. Glass, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to connect with everyone, even if we have to do so remotely. And um, I also want to welcome everyone and say how excited I am to get to connect with all of you and, and learn from you. I want to express my appreciation to Kevin Brown for serving in the interim role for these past several months. Um, it, it really is extraordinary for Kentucky to have uh, a talent uh, like Kevin's and somebody who's so committed to the department and the state serve in this role. So thank you, Kevin, for uh, stewarding um, Kentucky and the department through an extraordinary period of time. I know that when you signed up to be the interim, you didn't sign up for all of this. Uh, so I know it's been really hard work and we're grateful for all that you've done to support kids uh, in the state. Um, I think I, I want to be really brief because I have a limited amount of time with you and I'd love to just hear your perspectives on things as we start to move through the agenda. But I'll just um, preface it, to preface all of this to say this is an incredibly stressful, extraordinary time that public education is going through, not just in Kentucky, but really around the world. Um, systems around the world are struggling with how do we reopen schools, how do we do so safely. We have seen some other international systems that have been successful in doing that. There are lessons from those systems that I think we can use in the United States, but we really don't have any options that are without downsides or without risks or without significant trade-offs. Um, so I've seen some of the plans that have come out in Kentucky already about how school systems are planning to reopen. Uh, that's based on the information they have right now. Uh, things can and probably will change. Uh, if we see large scale outbreaks across the state, I expect we'll see more 
uh, schools moving into that non-traditional instruction role. Um, if we get schools open in August and September, and we start to see uh, some schools around the country that have been successful in reopening as we have seen in international systems. I also expect more schools around the country and in Kentucky to start adopting those practices and getting open back open in some in-person format, even if that looks like an interim uh, structure. So uh, that's an extraordinary pressure uh, that everyone is hyper-focused on trying to find an answer to um, right now. A, a second um, concern that uh, I, I think is gonna come up quickly is all, of, all the conversations around anti-racism and equity that have um, become really priorities across the country in the wake of George Floyd's murder um, earlier this summer and the events uh, that happened in, in Kentucky, in Jefferson County, um, really bring this issue that's long overdue for a conversation and some work and some honest discussion around what schools are doing in this area. Um, it's time for us to talk about that. Um, so that'll be work uh, once we get through this initial crisis of getting school open in some form. We've got work to do around that. And then we've got a really tough budget uh, decisions, I think, on the horizon for Kentucky and for schools. So they'll, they'll, these, all three of these uh, challenges are extraordinary uh, by themselves put together. It really puts an uh, unprecedented stress on school leaders and on school systems and on educators and parents and students um, across the state. Looking longer term, I hope to get us uh, uh, through and past all this with, with your help and with the work of all the talented educators and the support of parents and communities in the state. Um, but I, I really think it's time for us to have a conversation as a state about what school could be, uh, where education could go, and are we really preparing our students for uh, the world and uh, a, a globally interconnected, uh, very competitive, lightning fast, data rich, um, automated uh, e economy? Are we preparing our kids? Uh, for that. So I think that's an exciting conversation that we need to get to uh, over the longer term. Um, I'm again delighted to be with you. I really do believe that having students in the conversation changes the conversation because when you have the person there that uh, that is affected by the decision, it really um, fundamentally changes that decision for the better because you're able to hear what their perspective is and get their input. Uh, so we, we are delighted to have this group. I'm delighted to have this group and look forward to working with you more. With that, I'm going to turn things back over to Tony and Tony, let you jump into uh, the introduction and goals. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Glass and thank you, Kevin. We appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to go right into introductions with, um, with our students so that you all can learn more about our students and um, where they're, what districts they come from and a little bit more about them. And we're gonna start at the top of the alphabet. So um, students, what I need you to do is when you're introducing yourselves, make sure you turn your um, volume up and you turn your videos on. And what I'd like you to do is introduce your name, your grade um, in your high school, what high school you are representing and what district you are in. And we'll start with um, Wallace Caleb Bates. All right, hello everyone. I am, of course, Wallace Caleb Bates, and I am a senior at Breathitt County. Um, let's see here. I represent. I'm not sure which KDE district I'm in. I know that there are so many um, different members on this council from different districts. So I'm not sure what number I'm in. If you know, You're number number seven. You're in board district seven. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's it. Uh, what goals do you have this year? Oh, uh, what goals do I have? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so, well, there are a number of issues that I want to look at, um, whether it be mental health issues that we see um, facing young people across the Commonwealth, um, the ongoing drug issues that we see in our schools. Um, and then also I want to look at, as Dr. Glass mentioned, um, equality and um, ensuring that, you know, we're looking at everyone when we make decisions. So. Perfect. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate that. Um, next up, Trevin. Hello, everybody. I'm Trevin Bevins, and I'm a, a junior at Shelby Valley High School, and I help represent Eastern Kentucky on the council. And some of my goals are really just to make sure that we are providing opportunities for everyone, like those who are choosing to attend college and those who don't, because the reality is not every student is going to attend college, so we have to make sure we provide those opportunities for them, those not attending college here in Kentucky, 
so we all can stay and help Kentucky grow together, really. Perfect. Thank you. And Trevin, you are also um, in Board District 7, just to let you know. <laughs> all right. Next is okay. um, Madeline, Maddie Black Blankenship. Um, hi, I'm Madeline Blankenship. I am a junior at Pulaski County High School. Um, also don't know what district that is, but um, somewhere mm -hmm. south. And uh, I think one of my biggest goals this year, especially at the start of this year, is just going to be making sure that everyone is getting the um, right amount of information given to them and making sure that all students are learning the way they should in a traditional like setting. And if we end up, you know, having to do some non-traditional things that everyone's still getting the normal amount and the same amount um, of learning that they should. Okay. All right, Madeline, you're in um, District 3 and she's one of our returning members from last year as well. Um, next up, we have Gavin. Uh, hi, I'm Gavin Brunig, and I'm from Elizabethtown High School. Uh, I also don't know what number district I'm in. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. But um, one goal that I have for this year would be um, to make sure everyone has the same say, a, a same say. So like uh, uh, when relating to equality and equity. So if someone is a different race, they have the same amount of say and stuff uh, uh, like someone from another race. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Um, our next student is Drake Calhoun. Um, my name is Drake Calhoun. I'm an incoming sophomore at Cowley County High School. Um, I believe I represent District 1. And um, my goal is like to establish an increased passion for education in Kentucky like throughout peers and teachers and just making sure that everybody has a voice and a platform. Okay. All right, our next um, student is Michaela Crumble, and she is in Hickman County, and we may need to look at the text. We do have some students from um, the Kentucky School for the Deaf and Kentucky School for the Blind that are on our council. Michaela, are you, in, are you joining us today? All right, we can get back to Michaela. The next student is Reese Dickin. Hi, my name is Reese Dickin and I'm a senior at Barron County High School and I also do not know what my district is. But my goal for this year is to engage constructive communication between students and teachers to positively impact learning and the achievement of students. Perfect. All right, our next um, district, our next student is Roheen Dutt. Hello, uh, my name is Roheen Dutt. I am a junior at DuPont Manual High School in Louisville, Kentucky. And some of my goals for this year are making sure that we're still meeting educational standards during this COVID crisis, as well as looking to implement uh, some more sort of real life skills into the classroom, whether that be financial literacy, computer science, and just preparing ourselves for the future. Perfect, thank you. Um, next up is Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophie Farmer. I am a senior at the Gatton Academy, but I'm from Central Kentucky. I uh, really wanna focus on inequities, specifically ones that have become more prevalent with the COVID crisis. And I also really wanna focus on mental health and how we can provide for our students while they're learning at home. Perfect. Thank you, Sophie. Next up, we have Renuka. I'm Renuka Gentila. I'm a junior from Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, which is in Fayette County, and I believe that's District 6. 
Um, so I actually wasn't here at the last couple meetings, but I was just like reading along with the summary docs and something which really interested me and which I really want to carry forward with is um, firstly, the fact that when we have NTI, so non-traditional learning, we need to find the correct balance between NTI and traditional in-person learning so that we meet all the educational standards and that students are meeting the required standards for their grade and that they're college and career ready. And secondly, what really, um, what I really want to look at is that student voice team, how they came earlier and they talked about, um, you know, school climate and culture. And that's really important to me personally. So especially during this time. So I really want to look into that as well. Great. Thank you very much for sharing. Appreciate that. Um, next up, we have Solela Gonzalez. Hi, um, I'm Salela Elliott Gonzalez. I'm going to be a junior in at Ballard High School this year in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and I guess like some of the main goals that I would have throughout this year is to really focus on like the mental health of all of our students and especially address coping skills that they have and possibly being able to find ways to um, create interventions that are helpful for not only the students, but also the teachers um, or any type of any staff that we have. Um, to be able to help with that and hopefully to also address bridging any gaps um, that can be seen in, like based on socioeconomic status and that often reflect um, the any type of mental health or Ill illnesses that are experienced as well. So, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, our next student um, is Nashawn Harrison. Um, hello, my name is Nashon here. Nashon, can you turn your video on for me? Oop, and your audio, we might have a little bit of a, let's see here. It's feel, feel safe and comfortable with in their school environment, along with helping them be able to express any mental health issues that may come along the way when traveling through high school in beyond okay and you are a junior at phoenix we may have had a can you all hear me yeah we hear sorry, you i can... think i think okay. he froze we may, I think you froze up a little bit there, Nashon. So Nashon is a junior at the Phoenix School of Discovery in Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, next is Layla. Hi, my name is okay. Layla Hayes. Hi, okay. <laughs> I'm a senior at DuPont Manual and um, I'm in District APPS. And so my goals for the year are to accommodate for various students who were affected by COVID and make sure that all students can still be successful, whether they're doing NTI or in-person classes. And um, I also think that teaching students more about racial relations is also important um, and teach them about how people are affected by it so that in times like these, uh, students can grow and be more active citizens. Okay. Thank you, Layla. Our next uh, student is Viviana. Hi, my name is Viviana Heredia. I'm going to be a senior at Royal High School in the Boone County Schools District. Um, so one of my main goals this year is to kind of change how we deal with mental health inside of high schools and how we go about it um, as well as how doctors Dr. Glass, um, and bring up conversations about racism, especially how we've dealt with it for the past few months, and we're going to come back into school. Um, and so, kind of starting a culture in which we're comfortable talking about those things. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, our next student is um, Elizabeth Holcomb. And for Elizabeth, she's going to turn on her video, I think, and then she will also, for her introduction, she will be using the chat feature. So please turn on your chat feature.
and I will read that for you. You can, um, and everyone uh, should be able to turn on your closed captioning uh, with the Teams function. Her name is Elizabeth Holcomb. She is a senior at the Kentucky School for the Deaf. Um, and she doesn't have any goals for 2021 yet. Um, she is also a returning member, a very valued returning member of our Student Advisory um, Council. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, next up is Jack Johnson. Hi, I'm Jack Johnson, and I'm a sophomore at Marshall County High School. I believe that's the first district, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, my goals are coming up with positive and workable conditions for students and teachers in the high schools um, with the COVID-19 pandemic because with all that we're going to, have to make a lot of changes and I think just um, making students and uh, administrators and teachers as comfortable as possible will be a huge benefit. Perfect. All right next is Logan. Hello I'm Logan Justice and I will be a junior at Paul Lawrence Dunbar this year in Fayette County. I'm not for sure what my district is. I think Renuka said that it was District 6, um, so I'll go with that. And then some goals that I have this year is to make sure that since, you know, we're going through this pandemic and I think a lot of people are going to be starting back with the non-traditional instruction, that we are making sure that we still have like equitable opportunities for all of our students. And then we look at how we can still like not fall behind while we're learning and make sure that it's going to be challenging, but not frustrating, I think would be important. Okay, perfect. So Fayette County is actually District 5. You're right there on that District 5 and 6 line. So just FYI, I will make sure you all get a map so you all know where you guys are too. I do not expect you, most people do not know, um, most people in the state who live in the state do not know their board district. So no worries on that. Um, our next student is Miles. Miles? Uh, hey, my name is Miles McGinnis. I go to South Oldham High School. Uh, I don't know what district I'm in, um, but one goal that I have this year is to address the trauma that students and families have faced. Uh, since March, uh, when all this started, a lot of families have lost jobs. A lot of people have got, gotten hit by the disease hard. A lot of people have had to go on fixed incomes and have struggled uh, paycheck to paycheck. So I want students to know that there are other students who have gone through those issues as well. And there's, it's time to bring a conversation about and try to have some unity uh, there. Perfect. Thank you, Miles. And Oldham County is in District 6. All right. Next is Soliana. Um, hi, I'm Soliana. I'm an incoming junior at Eastern High School in Jefferson County. And some of my goals are to provide a safe and effective school environment for students and to bring up any concerns or opinions I have in my community. Perfect. Thank you, Soliana. Um, our next student is Anastasia. Hi, my name is Anastasia Panaritos. I'm a sophomore at South Oldham High School, and I believe it's District 6. Uh, some goals that I have for this year is to bridge the achievement and learning gap and ensure that everyone gets the education they deserve throughout the pandemic and see how we can incorporate financial literacy into day-to-day -day, uh, school curriculum. Perfect. Next um, we have is Cade Scott. Uh, hi, my name is Cade. Uh, I'm going to be a senior at Floyd Central High School, which I believe is the seventh district. Um, my goals for this year would just to be to uh, maintain student health and safety during the pandemic uh, while also ensuring a quality year educationally. Perfect. Thank you, Cade. Um, next, we have Lauren Shackelford. Um, hi, I'm Lauren Shackelford. Uh, I go to Corbin High School. I'll be a senior. I'm not sure which board district that is. Um, but my goal is um, to find a safe way to return to school in person because I think that's kind of our best um, way of getting a good education. Um, although even it may not be possible, but to improve on our NTI technology. But I think returning to import returning in person is important because there are some resources available 
to students that they may not be able to get through NTI. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Um, next up, we have Gracie. Um, hi, my name is Gracie Smith. I'm a sophomore. Um, my primary school is Kentucky School for the Blind, but I also do half a day at Central High School in Jefferson County. Um, I, um, I live in Hardin County, though. It's kind of confusing. Um, and some of my, I'm not sure what district that is, but it's fine. And, um, or what I count as. But my main goal this year, at least for the beginning of the year, I, I want to make sure that NTI can go as smooth as possible because last year, at least personally for me, there were a lot of hiccups and a lot of students may not have internet or things at home and I wanna make sure everyone has an equal chance at learning until we can go back in the classroom. Great, thank you, Gracie. We're excited to, to have you and uh, the Kentucky School for the Blind uh, represented this year again as well, thank you. Um, next, Samuel Smith. Uh, hello, I'm Samuel Smith. Uh, I'm from, I'm a incoming junior at Davis County High School. Uh, again, I don't know what my uh, district is, but uh, uh, one of my big, um, what I would like to talk about is that uh, I would really like to have, when we are reopening uh, with COVID or not, uh, whatever the discussion is, I would really like to bring uh, high schoolers uh, into the conversation, uh, especially at more local levels where I think uh, kids are just kind of being pushed out of the conversation. Uh, and I would also like to expand our technology classes. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, next up is Lil Hoy. Uh Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a, a rising senior at Paul Ernst Dunbar High School in Fayette County. Uh, that's District 5. And uh, short term goals for next year, we have to resolve NTI issues because for the foreseeable future, at least in Fayette County, where cases are drastically going upwards and uh, not reaching a peak yet, essentially, we have we're basically stuck with NTI for the next few months, I assume. So we have to fix some of the issues with that. And that would probably include better access to technology for those who are less able to do that. And better virtual softwares in order to teach students more effectively because uh, it's unanimous, unanimously determined that all uh, that in school instruction is probably the best way to go in terms of actually teaching kids content. And long term goals when NTI uh, ceases to happen, we need to basically reform some of our school curriculum because what I see a lot is that people people don't master content because they don't get the basics and not enough time is spent on the basics of those concepts. So I think uh, uh, a change in curriculum could really help with that in terms of the long term goals. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Williams. I'm from Anderson County High School. Um, I think it's District 30 or 31. Five. Five? Oh, For the board. Okay. Board district. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, one goal that I have and I want to focus on this year is definitely making sure that the kids or the parents of kids who go to school um, that fear um, going back because of COVID and just the virus in general. Um, I want to provide them with the best quality learning at home because I know going to school and taking online classes is definitely different. I want to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to grow as students during this year. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Um, next, we have uh, Amy. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy, and I'm a rising senior at the Craft Academy in Moorhead, Kentucky. And I think I'm in District 7, but I'm not sure. And then my goals for this year is just to ensure the students are still inspired to learn, whether that be in the classroom or in a, or at home in a virtual home in a virtual format. I think uh, whether or not we do end up being uh, learning in TI or being in the classroom, it's still important that students are learning um, however they can. And then I also want to make sure that seniors specifically have a smooth a tr smooth of a transition as possible as they go into college um, later on. Okay, thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, and then we have Claire.
Claire? Young, are you here, Claire? If not, I can go back up. I know Peyton Hall had told me he was going to be able to join us a little bit later. Peyton, yeah. have you joined? Yes, I'm here. Okay, do you want to do your introduction? Yeah. So, my name is Peyton Hall, and I'm a senior at Franklin High School. Um, I don't know which district it is, but we are like northeast Kentucky. We're near Moorhead, if you may know where that is, because um, not very many people know where Fleming County is. Um, my goal this year is to represent underrepresented, underrepresented rural Kentucky and to tackle the concerns with internet across the state, um, especially in rural Kentucky, especially, and also if there is like another spike of COVID cases once we go back to school. Um, a lot of students especially in my school district, are having to go to paper learning. And they also don't have that ability to communicate with teachers and their educators as well. So to tackle those concerns with the internet would be my top priority. Okay, great. Um, wonderful. So um, just a couple of things. Um, so the only two that we missed are Claire Young um, from Warren. So if I missed Claire and she's not hearing me, just pop in and let me know in the chat. And then Michaela Crumble. Um, so just let me know at some point we can get to your introductions. And then I also just wanted to let you know um, that the Kentucky Board of Education districts, um, your districts are aligned to the districts of the Kentucky Supreme Court. So um, I can I'm going to send you an email so that you all know which districts you are representing, just so you all know that. Um, but this is per statute to ensure that there's statewide representation on the Kentucky Board of Education. So just a, a fun fact for you. Um, we're going to go ahead and get into our second up there. And Tracy right there, uh, Tracy Goff has uh, put that into your uh, chat there and you can click on the, um, the link as well. Um, our next item on the agenda is um, reentry for the fall and non-traditional instruction, which we're calling 2.0. Oh, Lauren, I missed Lauren. I am so sorry, Lauren. Go ahead, Lauren. Did I miss anybody else? Go ahead, Lauren. Lauren, can you hear me? You might be on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. My name is Lauren Little. I'm from Clinton County High School. I'm going to be a sophomore. I'm not sure which district I'm in, but one of my goals is to make sure that every student, no matter what economic status, has the same quality of learning, whether they have internet or Wi-Fi or whatnot. Thank you, Lauren. I'm so sorry. I skipped right over you. I totally apologize on that. I knew that was going to happen. Did I miss anybody else? Please let me know. OK. Perfect. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and you are in District 3, so I will make sure again you can click on that lab, that map that Tracy um, has put in there in the link. But I will make sure you guys get a nice um, color coded link so you can see which district you represent. Um, and several of you will be representing several kind of several counties just by the way it's made up with populations. So, um, so our next item on the introduction in the agenda is reentry in the fall and non traditional instruction, which we're calling uh, NTI 2.0. Um, and I know Dr. Foster is on the agenda as well as um, da Dave David Cook, who's our division director, and he pretty much oversees NTI. Um, David, are you on? Yes, I am, uh, Tony. Um, Why don't you go ahead and lead us off? Yeah, I okay. will. And Ke Kelly will be right back. She had two meetings that she had to to talk on, so she's over there. Um, I wanted to just follow the suit, Tony, and say my goal is to hopefully make NTI be strong enough that um, folks don't have to say we're stuck with it anymore. So that's kind of my goal that we we talk about it in a little bit better um, light because we know that the challenges occurred in the spring and we know that over half of our districts um, had never done anything like that before. Um, it was a little bit easier for your district. Some of you are in districts who were doing NTI when we did it for snow closures and things like that, but um, this was obviously a whole different situation. So what we wanna do today is get your thoughts um, on both sides of, of the equation. As, as many times you've been asked questions in, in on topics, you get 
to ask that that double sided question, which is what about NTI? The way I like to look at it is what about non traditional instruction do we want to keep as we think about, as Dr. Glass said earlier in our conversation, all his ideas and visions for what school can be? There are things about it because I know that you all know as you move forward into your post secondary lives, much of what NTI look is is probably the way your your technical or or four year college um, opportunities are going to look like. You're going to do a lot more online stuff. You're going to do a lot more hybrid stuff. You're going to do a lot more LMS based learning management system stuff. So the first question I want us to to dive into is what about NTI worked or what about NTI as we think forward and know that um, remote, not just learning, but remote learning and remote life are going to be a bigger part of our lives post pandemic than they were before, just in general. I think you've seen that in the way we shop and the way we interact with people, just like we're doing today. Um, we're going to see a lot more of that kinds of situations. So I'd like to start with that and then we'll move into what were the challenges? What were the things that may um, that you don't want to keep or that don't seem to work as you think about um, learning and instruction and access and connectivity? Um, we'll talk about those things as well. But what what are, let's start with that and, and you can if you want to type into the chat box, that's fine. Or if you want to to speak, we have in Teams, we have a raising your hand function. If you click on the three little dots and you can raise your hand and, and do that do that as well. So who wants to just start us off with that with that conversation? What worked? What what do you see as possibly something that can be kept um, if we move forward? Jack, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, so I really liked how last year with students with internet connection, they could uh, make virtual calls with the teachers that they were um, or that they were taking the class with and that you could also schedule it on Google Meets or whatever um, the teacher preferred to use. At the same time, it might be harder this year, but if there's a way to maybe keep that, I think that would be a, a, a major plus. Great. And we also are working harder to because we do know still and, and one of the challenge, one of the chief things that our technology folks at KDE have been doing is working on all those access and connectivity things and trying to make sure more kids have those access and connect connectivity points. But we are also working to um, ensure that if folks don't have that access, Jack, that there's a there's a sort of old fashioned phone way for teachers to talk to their kids as well. So make more of those kinds of connections between students and teachers. Thanks, Jack. Anybody next person, anybody want to raise their hand or have a question? Or a comment shouldn't be a question, maybe. Uh, is it Layla? So Layla, hi. So Layla. I think it, am I the person you're talking about? Yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, sorry. So I, I think like one aspect that was really helpful for um, many like family member, well, like large families and just like um, any student was that personally for like me and the district that I'm in, I'm in Jefferson County, we had um, the chance to like have NTI sort of all in like our hand or on a computer. And what was helpful is that um, the way that it was set up, a lot of our teachers were able to plan ahead and we knew what was coming. And I think especially in the conditions that we have right now, um, especially for younger students who may not be used to like working around um, a computer or may not like be able to have like a, some sort of accountability or our family like schedules don't work well, it's easier to be able to figure out what works um, and plan like for the week, if that made sense or uh, sure. weeks ahead just so that it's easier for like not only the family, but also the student because they know what's coming, if that makes sense. Absolutely, C certainly it does. Um, thank you. And um, anybody else with, um, Ke Ke you, you like Caleb, right? I'm, I'm looking at, it's popping up on my screen. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. I, yeah, I'll go by Caleb usually. Um, okay. And then so, I'll get Layla. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I want to say that, you know, first of all, um, 
I think the pandemic was stressful for every student, regardless of the circumstances going on in their district. Um, the flexibility of being able to complete assignments um, when, wherever students were able to do so, I think that that really was a positive here. Um, also, at the beginning of the pandemic, during the um, Stay Healthy at Home initiative, um, families were able to really focus on spending more time with each other. Um, I know that my mom works at Moorhead State and there toward the end we were both home um, and usually I wasn't able to see her very often. However, we were really able to grow um, together during the beginning there of the pandemic. And then also um, I think that in general um, it's great that the NTI was able to keep students safe um, where you know it would have been difficult um, if students had been in the building learning surrounded by the coronavirus so yeah and i'm just gonna real quickly before i go to layla i'm gonna in the comment section in the chat section you all can read some of these but sophie was talking about having access to recorded lessons and asynchronous learning opportunities so that if you weren't able to do your schoolwork in a normal school day you didn't miss things um, um, and then amy sort of said the flip side of that which was um, my teacher didn't do that. So I think one of the one of the challenges which you might mention in a few minutes is is we're trying at KDE to better prepare teachers for teaching in this kind of world because that's obviously um, one of the areas of gap or or inequity as well was not not everybody was an all star um, LMS user, a Google Classroom user or whatever platform you all were using. So um, and and Anna, I think that's also important too. Um, and we saw this great change happen over the course of NTI in the spring. A lot of teachers did over assign when they started out. They weren't thinking about you all having seven classes or six classes or whatever the case might be. Um, but as they shifted and even when you all took spring breaks, um, a lot of teachers rethought the kinds of workloads they were giving. And I think that is important that you all have something that makes sense from a learning from a learning perspective as to the amount of work that you have to do. Um, so Layla, I want to go back to you. You you you've had your hand up. So um, um I don't think I, I don't I didn't mean to raise my hand. If oh, that was okay. the case. Sorry oh, about that. No, but I think this is I, I don't it think was, it was me. Yeah, there we go. I thought it was another there, another one. So go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I was actually going to talk about what Sophie commented. I thought that having teachers record lessons was really helpful. Um, sometimes even I couldn't attend the live lessons, and I'm sure that's the case for many students. Um, and it also helps because we can go at our own pace and um, like rewind the video if we need to repeat something, and it's a lot easier for students don't really have as much as a connection to the teacher to still learn um, in the class. Like if they didn't, or if they weren't comfortable like reaching out to the teacher to um, request like a video call with them personally, um, I think that having this recorded lesson um, eases that tension. Thank you. I'm glad we I'm glad we got you in. I'm going to I'm going to stop us right there. If you have additional things you want to talk about in, in that for that question, um, I'd love to have you keep them coming in the chat, which we get to keep on, on the back end. So we're, we're excited that you, we're gonna not stop asking that question because, and then the other side of that question, and, and um, I think it was Amy that might have started us a little bit on that, which is um, what were the challenges? What were, what about, um, and we know some of the big ones. We know the access and connectivity issue was was a big one, but um, and some people not being having access to asynchronous types of instructional resources like videos from teachers. What else um, do you think um, we need to continue to work on here at the department um, as we try to make, as Tony said, an NTI 2.0 better than NTI 1.0? So uh, Peyton, we'll start with you. Uh, one thing that I would like to see, and this may be something that um, you may, I may need to talk to like more of our districts like, is I would like if there were like office hours for our teachers where students can come into the school and get one-on-one -on -one help. Um, because like the big issue of going back to school, I'm not sure as, as if it is, is the 
how close students and teachers are, but it's like you can't put 700 or 1,000 students in one school building together. So I would like it if I could go to school, um, especially for those students that are in higher level in college classes, um, because I was in pre-calculus this past year, and we all know how difficult that is. And so uh, although the lessons were online through Moorhead State, it was really difficult um, when I did need my teacher's help, and she struggled to give that help because how do you teach a student step by step when you can't sit there and like explain it? Mm-hmm. That's great. Thank you, Peyton. Uh, Jack. Uh, I think that another thing that uh, we're going to have to really focus on this year is not overworking our teachers because they will be may probably be having to do two totally different lessons. And I think that planning period that a lot of teachers have uh, is going to be huge this year. And but it's going to also be difficult because we will have to have uh, either the virtual communication uh, along with them teaching the actual class. So if they have uh, class times that you maybe have to turn in your work during the class hours, maybe that could uh, cause kind of like a collision or something. Sure. Thank you, Jack, for that. Uh, Trevin. Yeah. Well, I'm from Pike County and our district's been doing NTI several years, but the problem with it here now that we've had to go with, with it weeks on time is that most of, a lot of the students here don't have internet. And like for me, I do have internet, of course, and it was easier with the virtual lessons. Like we would get on and we would have class for pre-cal, but the students that didn't get to get on and have that to have the teachers are explaining to the teachers. All right, we were getting a little bit of feedback on that one, Trevin. Um, if you don't mind, maybe put your what you were just saying in the chat box just so we don't get lost on what you were saying. I, I don't know if it was just me, but it was there was a little interference there. So I just want to make sure we don't we can capture what you were saying. Okay. Thank you, Trevin, though. I, I heard a, a good bit of it and, and sort of towards the end, I think, is when we lost some of your conversation. So um, I think, Drake, you're next. Um, so my first thing is that I think the content was mostly review, at least for my school district. And it was like, it made sense because we were at the end of the school year, but going into like a brand new school year, I think it's important that we find an effective way to teach new material. Um, And then also there was like a lack of uniformity between what my teachers used because some use Google Meet, some use Google Classroom, some use Microsoft, and then some just did email or paper. And so it got kind of confusing because I had six classes to like keep it all in line and just like maybe we could figure out a way to pick something or just a couple um, just kind of streamline what we're doing and make it like more efficient, I guess. Yeah, thank you for that. We, we One of the things we're doing in a lot of our guidance and recommendations is to try to help districts see um, that, especially by grade level, like high school, or middle school that everybody's kind of using the same kinds of platforms would, would be very helpful. Um, um, Anastasia. I think one problem that I guess could get fixed is especially for younger kids because I have younger siblings. I'm not sure that they're comprehending what they're learning through virtual because like a first grader won't exactly remember everything and ensuring that they remember things for the next year. So I think not only focusing on what high school kids, especially for AP college level courses, is to understand that younger kids need longer time to understand things and instead of pushing new things on them every day. Because I saw a struggle with that with like some of my siblings being like, I don't know why is she giving me something new if I don't understand exactly what I'm doing. And especially not having the teacher right there to ask a question is hard. Yeah, that's one of our um, focuses. We're doing a lot of professional development teachers. You guys should know that so that it gives you some hope. Um, and one of the areas of focus for us is K-3 teachers. 
So kindergarten through third grade teachers and helping them better understand the right ways to provide instruction in a remote setting, digital, virtual, however you want to say it. Um, Logan. So for me, I'm from Fayette County, so we had never done NTI before, so it was definitely a struggle for us starting off. And I think one thing that kind of got better over time, but was kind of the uniformity of our schedule. So I, I go to Dunbar, so we have A day, B day, four classes a day. So for me, it was pretty light work. Most of it was review. Um, I didn't really learn a lot of new things throughout the whole NTI thing. For my sister, though, she had seven classes a day and seven different assignments each day. And so it was like the difference in the workload was totally different. Um, it was taking me like half a day to get my stuff done full day for her. And so I think just kind of recognizing that throughout just the whole county to make sure that we have the same workload for all students. You know, we all go to school the same amount of hours each day to make sure that that goes over into NTI for the same amount of time, kind of in the same amount of workload, which is important. Yeah, I think you're bringing up too, Logan, one of the things that we're, we're also working with our districts on, and that is how do you make NTI more of a continuation of what you do in the classroom rather than a stopping and a doing and something else, doing something completely different than what you do in your regular classroom so that there isn't as much of a drop off, if, the, if you will. I mean, there's obviously going to be some things because you're not sitting in front of that teacher, but we want you to we want districts to try to in, in NTI 2.0 is to think about it more as a continuation of learning. How do you how do you make things like that happen? So thank you again for that. I think, oh, Renuka, I think you're the last one whose hands that no. And then we OK, Rowan and then Renuka and then Rowan. So I was briefly talking about this in the chat, but I too, like Logan, I'm from Fayette County. I go to Dunbar as well. Um, so we're new to the whole NTI concept. So what I really thought was lacking was feedback from students, because especially for me, I had all four of my AP classes on A day and I had like no AP classes on B day. So it was just really concentrated into one day and I was getting so much work. And very few, if at all, of my teachers were on, you know, sending feedback forms or polls on how we felt about the workload and if it was like stressing us out. So I feel like if we had a platform like that, I'm not sure if that exists, but if we have one, it would be really helpful. Great, thank you. Rowan. So I'm in Jefferson County and uh, we just started NTI in April. And uh, there was like a lack of ensuring that we were mastering the content. So, and I know it's a bit difficult to like administer tests online and stuff, but uh, if we could transition to like more project based learning or things that ensure that we are mastering the content. I know in our uh, in my Java class, we did like coding projects and stuff and that ensured that we were still getting the concepts down and stuff. So if we could apply that to like other classes in a way, I think that would be extremely beneficial. Yeah, you're excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah, we're hoping again another 2.0 um, evolution is to help districts see that um, project based learning assignments that aren't just one day at a time assignments, but more um, generally thought of as, as a more of a project approach where you're working on something um, for multiple days is also helpful. We've known that in NTI from the beginning of NTI that that that, that model works better. So thanks Ron for that. Um, I think that's that's all the questions that I see so far um, and hands raised. Let me look and make sure. If anybody else has not um, had a chance to can't figure out the hand raising if they want to pipe in right now. And Trevin and, and Renuka still have their hands up, but I think we if you have another question that's or a comment that's um, Tre Trevin, do you have another? Oh, there it goes. It's gone. <laughs> so thank you all for all um, the the comments also in the um, in the chat. Um, uh, Jack, I appreciate the um, needing to have a senior year. We all, we all, and Tony has worked really hard at the end of the year to make it as as normal as possible. But I know that that there are things about your senior year, and and I, you know, obviously we all hope that we're not having to spend a lot of time in NTI. But I, I hope we can figure out the ways that it that it, as I said, it continues to be something that is val more valuable than just going through the motions of doing assignments or whatever that that we get more teachers who are 
comfortable with the online ways, the digital ways of doing of doing learning so that um, we can make sure that it's as, as high quality as possible. Um, so Cade, um, let me see what you've, I didn't see, let me finish reading yours. Yes. Kate, if you want to if you want to read for our interpreter, that would be great. If you can turn your video and volume on so our interpreter can read. Oh, OK, um, yeah, I didn't see the raise hand option, but uh, I think that uh, like the breakdown in communication was one of the biggest problems with NTI. Um, I don't think that. I mean, obviously they're not in person, so the students really couldn't create the bond as somebody else said, but I think to kind of fix that, that whenever the uh, instructors did live streams or recorded lessons, I think that was probably the most um, like effective use of NTI. Um, I, like the classes I had that did the recorded lessons, I learned like a lot more versus them just sending stuff in through like Blackboard or a tool like that. Um, I really like the office hours idea too. I think if there was a specific designated time and medium that students could communicate to teachers, then that would be like the best way going forward. Okay. Thank you, great. Kate. I think that's I think that's a great way. I'm gonna kind of sh st slow it down, Tony, because I know you've got an agenda. And um, but Kate makes a great point, and I and I I had at, wanted to ask you this last question, but if you want to think about it, you can put it in the chat or whatever is um, office hours, um, asynchronous learning, um, chats, all of those things are things that many of you, especially if you do plan on a post-secondary educational experience, mm -hmm. that's how you're going to learn. So you're, those are the kind of things we want to build into NTI 2.0 so that there's more of that ability to, to provide um, interaction between teachers and students than we had in the spring. So thank you all for all the different ways you sort of mentioned that challenge that the communication um, was the problem. But I'm going to I'm going to stop and, and let Tony get the um, agenda moving on. I'm not sure if Dr. Foster ever got back with us or not, um, but she may have some more re reopening things she wants to 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 jump on. But thank you all very much. You all are, as Kevin says, I love you all more than any other council that we deal with because I appreciate your voice um, in, in all that we do in my division. So um, thank you again for your time today. Okay, great. Hey, Tony, uh, we'll, this is, oh, this she is, is. hi, she? yes, sorry guys, I had to jump off and I'm, I'm back on now, but I've been listening to the conversation and I'm very impressed with your all's goals for the year and also what you've shared about what worked for you in NTI and, and what didn't work in NTI. And, and I just want to pose one question and feel free to raise your hands or add the information in the chat. Um, and, and if you, David, if you already covered this, I apologize, but I would just be curious about uh, any major concerns about um, coming back to school, not so much in the realm of NTI, but for those of you that you know that are starting school face to face, if you uh, don't care to put in the chat or, or feel free to jump in, I'd just be curious to know what concerns you have about um, re-entering the school year in August, if you have any. We've been working really hard at the department to try to develop guidance to share with your principals and your teachers and your superintendents uh, to keep everyone safe during this time. But I would love to hear your feedback if you all have any uh, concerns about going back to face to face instruction. Looks like Lauren. Lauren Little. You got your hand raised. Yes, yeah, so. One of the concerns I have is that I know there are guidelines and stuff, but I feel like some of the students may not comply to the rules and they might bring the COVID in and infect other students with it and have to have the whole school shut down. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Anybody else? I'm trying to see if the other hands are raised. Uh, looks like Caleb. Yeah, hey, um, so one of my biggest concerns is that, you know, here in Kentucky, we have among the highest rates of grandparents that are caring for, um, you know, students. I'm worried that 
those at-risk individuals, if an outbreak does occur um, at a school, that the individuals who are caring for um, the students in that school will be infected and that their loss, the, their loss will be risked. Um, also, I'm concerned about social distancing in classrooms that are already, um, there's already a tight fit there. And then also I'm just concerned about um, sanitation of schools and, you know, ensuring that um, classrooms are being properly cleaned and that kind of thing. And then in, especially in cases where, um, you know, students can choose whether they're going to go in person or online, um, bridging the gap there and making sure that whether they choose online or in person, they're still receiving access to equal opportunities. Um, I know like as I'm going into my senior year, I'm thinking right now how it's, it'll be easier for me to be in person, to walk to my counselor's office to seek help with college applications and scholarship applications. Um, whereas if I was online, that might be um, an issue trying to fill out those applications and that kind of thing. That's sort of what came to mind there when I was thinking about that. But just generally speaking, um, working to ensure that, you know, young people, students are um, receiving a great education regardless of if they choose online or in person and regardless of if we move forward online or in person. Thank you. Okay, Sophie. So I mentioned two things in the chat. One thing that I'm particularly particularly concerned about is transportation and with things like buses. There's no way that you can bus all the kids that need to be bused and have them social distanced and that's going to really, really hit some of our lower income families who just can't afford to get their students to school on their own because they're working or they can't have the student can't have a car. And so it's just bridging, like making that gap even larger and making it so these students are even more at risk or they may just in some districts where you can do in person or virtual, they may just choose virtual simply because there's no way that you can social distance on buses and have everyone bus to school. I'm also really concerned about um, quarantining with families and things like in some districts, there's families that have a lot of students and they're spread out throughout the district. And if that family gets it, they can potentially infect all of the schools in a district and shut down a whole district. And so this idea of like, there's gonna be students that have to quarantine for so many different weeks because they just have a large family and things like that. A couple of things that I will share with you guys um, when the next pre presenter jumps on, I will put a link in the chat to our Healthy at Schools document that we have released. We've been working um, very closely with the Department of Public Health because they are the experts in um, health issues and, and concerns. And so I'll put that in the chat. That way you all can look through the uh, through the document because I think it might help ease some of your concerns about what it's going to look like when you do go to face to face classes. And um, I will address tra transportation. One of the things that public health has suggested for buses is that, um, you know, maybe in the past when you got on your on the bus, you just sat anywhere you wanted to, or maybe, uh, you know, the first available seat. But what we're going to do this year, if you ride a school bus, is that uh, the first students that get on the bus will actually take the seats furthest back. So we will load the bus from back to front. Uh, that way people aren't up moving around and you will be required to have an assigned seat on the bus for contact tracing. Um, also it, that if you have family members that ride the same bus with you, uh, they public health is suggesting that family members sit together um, on the bus. That way you're not, you know, mixing uh, necessarily with other families because that is a small area on the bus and so what they have said is that we do not have to social distance on the bus but you are required uh, to wear that mask so that's going to be really uh, important to make sure that all students on the bus you know wear the mask and they will load the bus from the back to the front so, so those are some of the safety precautions that are there um, around transportation and I will post the Healthy at School document in the chat and really encourage you guys to save that link and take a look at it because I think it will really help ease some of your concerns. So thank you all so much. Tony, is there anybody else that had anything they wanted to share? Yes, I believe Amy also. Okay. Amy. Yeah. 
Yeah, so what I said in the comment was mainly that some schools, um, like for example mine, they're not requiring students to get tested. They're recommending it, but it's not required. And I know that I've already talked to some of my classmates and they've been vacationing in other states and they've been doing things that, that might potentially give them the virus, whether that be um, like whether or not they're showing symptoms. And being in that closed environment in a classroom or just on in the school, that that could um that could create like room to to transmit it to somebody else. And I think that's a really big concern that's not being addressed. OK. All right, and then I think we have Drake as well. Um, in the chat, I just talked about how um, with like the uncertainty of the vaccination and like the dangers um, or like not only the dangers, but just like the concerns that parents have and the divide that it could create between those who support it and those who oppose it and like the people who role in vaccinating students or not vaccinating students. Perfect. All right. Um, I think we have another comment that Dr. Foster um, from Solela um, just about the major concerns being the difference in the quality of teaching um, with that students are receiving in school versus uh, through the NTI. Um, and it creates a contrast between demographics and socioeconomic groups because there may not be families that can afford to stay home with younger children and thus making a greater chance for lower income families to be at risk for getting um, COVID-19. So again, these are all great um, observations um, and comments. We really appreciate those. And there's gonna be um, additional opportunities um, for you all to provide feedback in our exit form that we'll be sending uh, towards the end of the meeting on these things. Um, so we really appreciate your, your thoughts. Uh, anything else, David or Kelly, you'd like to ask the students? I, I tremendous amount of great feedback and I know Dr. Foster got some great c conversation too and 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 as I said we're NTI 2.0 is is really we're, we're working really hard to to alleviate some of those gaps in things like what um, I think Celia was saying about um, um, we're working with teachers to make sure more teachers are better prepared to teach in this environment so hopefully that will alleviate some of that gap so Thank you all again for your time today. Great. Yes, thank you very much. And I did post the Healthy at School document in the chat. So please, I encourage you to take a look at that. Great. All right, guys. Well, thank you. So um, we do have a just a little amendment to the agenda. I did invite um, one of our seniors from the class of 2020 to come back and join us today. Um, CJ, are you there? CJ Johnson? Yes, I am here. Um, so I invited CJ to come back because last year um, he was very vocal on our council and provided a lot of really valuable feedback um, as well as our other um, students that came back as well. But um, I thought it would be interesting to get his perspective on, you know, the importance of sharing voice, um, particularly now that he's, you know, graduated and that is a, um, as a as a senior who's now a freshman in college. Um, just to share a couple of thoughts on uh, the council and how things went in the spring. So, CJ? Sure. Um, first off, good morning to everyone. Um, congratulations to our new members. I, uh, it's a great honor to be a part of this committee. I remember whenever I was first. Uh, um, but then I kind of sat down and I tried to figure out what I was passionate about, what I could what I would enjoy trying to better, which was um, mine was career and technical education. And don't ever feel like your like ideas are ever falling on deaf ears because I saw my ideas come into like effect. I've seen them kind of grow throughout the state and kind of the stigma of CTE gone down and just seeing how numbers have risen and how more kids are going into the career and technical field. Also, um, the COVID is definitely a big, big deal. I remember trying to figure that out this spring uh, as a senior. I know it was kind of tough trying to figure out what I'm going to do about graduation, all these what ifs, but um, have a bigger picture. That's my advice. Have a bigger picture about because hopefully COVID will end soon 
and it, you just got to be ready to transition into this next next couple of years. But um, yeah, my my advice: um, find something you're passionate about and attack it. Just come out with the best idea you got. And um, you uh, you uh, new ones, uh, you're going to be fine. You got a great great returning members. They're going to take care of you. So great. Thank you. Well, thank you, CJ. We really appreciate you coming back to to share with us. What are what are your uh, plans now? Um, I will be attending Midway University this fall, so I'm excited about that. I'll be playing baseball. Oh, and uh, I'm going to put my email in the uh, chat box, so if this is another resource for you uh, members, if you just need someone to read over something, if you have a question about how you should uh, attack an idea, how to uh, present it, that kind of thing, because I've made a few more <laughs> – you in my day so i'll be happy to help just just go in and email me i'll be pretty pretty active on it all right awesome. thank you thank cj you. we appreciate it thanks for joining us this morning no great all right so our next topic um this morning is uh, and our last agenda item is mental health and joining us this morning is dr damian sweeney um he's with our office of teaching and learning damian Hello. Hey. All right. So there you are. Know if you can see the, if you can see the slides, can you just let me know? I will. Let's see. Hold on. Not yet. I can. Yep. Can see them now. All right. Great. Um, so good morning. I'm super excited to be with you. Um, my name is Damian Sweeney. I'm the program coordinator for comprehensive school counseling, which means I'm a resource for for counselors. But I work on a lot of different things, including graduation requirements, um, some of the race equity things that you've discussed as well. So I'm really, really excited to be with you. Um, I echo what my colleagues have said. You're my favorite group to speak to. Um, I get so many different ideas. Um, one of the things that you can expect from your counselors is that they should should be hosting those drop-in times that you're you're requesting. So, um, so I hope that's helpful in the future. All right. So um, I've got a couple of guiding questions for for this um, presentation. I'm going to kind of go quick today uh, because there's a lot that I want to cover. Um, but I say that, and also say that I would really like you to be um, active in the chat box, um, and also. We can we need to build community um, so we can do that by you being open and vulnerable and this doesn't just go for the kids right for the students it goes for uh, my colleagues even if you're in the media um, we want you to be active um, and really uh, open when we do that again uh, we can build community so um, so today's presentation is all about how we can best support students who are experiencing trauma during the pandemic um, along with our teachers and staff so first and foremost, we have to normalize mental health issues and concerns. Um, so we also have to understand this, this kind of big idea. Um, all of us have experienced some sense of trauma with the pandemic, and almost all educators have been ex extraordinarily concerned about vulnerable students um, who must endure trauma in their homes daily. So this was, um, when this first hit, this was our biggest concerns. Um, biggest concern at the agency and again within our schools and districts is we know that kids um, have to endure this trauma and how are they going and often school is their safe haven so how are they going to um, how are they going to be how are they going to uh, become resilient how are they going to live through um, some of those really really difficult times in some in some um, overwhelming households. Um, also, many of these educators will experience vicarious trauma, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that at the end. Um, and then we should all have a better understanding of trauma experienced by students, um, along with vicarious or secondary trauma experienced by educators. We should also know warning signs of others and how to help. Um, so today seeks to do just that, okay? So in the chat box, on a scale of 1 to 10, Rank how comfortable you are talking with your friends about their mental health. And again, this goes for um, for everybody on the call. How comfortable are you talking with your friends about their mental health or your own? Uh, Samuel Smith, you get a shout out because my nephew's name is Samuel. My son's name is Smith. Um, so I really appreciate 
appreciate you being here. Um, OK, so I'm seeing a lot of sevens, eights, sixes. Um, see a nine, see a 99. Awesome. All right, great. Thank you. So um, I played soccer at Transylvania. I'm really excited for for CJ to, to be able to start his collegiate career at Midway for baseball. Um, but we had this we had preseason over the summer um, during one of my one of my seasons and preseason was extraordinarily difficult. Um, we had to run from campus over to a park. We had to, just to give you kind of a hint. It was a lot of sprinting. Um, you had you had guys on um, all fours that would uh, get up in a push up position. You would jump over them and then crawl under them. Um, so it was just this ongoing, just con just crazy condition. And then the, in the evenings you would um, you would play the game. So as you can imagine, this is a grueling preseason um, at Transy, and all we can think about is, man, I can't wait for that first game. First game finally comes, and within five minutes, the ref blows the whistle because lightning has struck, and he says, everybody's got to go back to their back to their locker rooms. So we get in the locker room, um, and it's college kids, college boys, college guys. So we see this old grimy soccer ball like you see on your screen right now. And we also see this electric pump and we decide that we're going to start taking bets. How long is it going to take for us to pump up this ball before it pops? Um, so most of us said one minute, 30 seconds, a couple of minutes. I think the most anybody said was eight minutes. And after 15 minutes, this ball had not popped. And we had been called back to the field um, to come and and um, restart the game. So we're playing, things are going well. It's our first game, and all of a sudden we hear this giant pop. So many of us treat our own lives like that. We are constantly waiting for the ball to pop and wondering when our next mistake will come or when we will be found out or called out. OK, there's this thing called imposter syndrome, and many of us feel secretly like we're not good enough and like other people are going to figure out that we're not good enough. So um, next, I want to show you um, just kind of the short video about the stigma of mental health. Let me know if you can hear it real quick, and I'm going to also turn on the, the closed caption. By the way, Tony, I put in um, an accessible version of this presentation in the chat box that you can share. Perfect. Thank you. You know that feeling where your thoughts you hear that? scare you? Yes. Or make life tough? Sometimes it feels like no one else in the world has those thoughts or feelings. No one seems to know how difficult it is to deal with your feelings. And it's not easy to share your deepest secrets. You might think something is wrong with you. Or you might worry what a... Bummer people think and all of that makes your thoughts and feelings worse our culture has created this environment of shame until the 1960s society sent people away if they had challenges managing their thoughts emotions and behaviors over time we learned that we didn't have to be afraid we learned how to help people get better we became hopeful but there are remnants of those images in our culture today which is why some people still feel uncomfortable talking about it. The stigma has taken new forms too. With more access to more people all the time, it can seem like the world is telling us it's not okay to be anything but perfect. The truth is, everyone has thoughts or feelings that can be hard to deal with. So why do we make it so difficult on ourselves by judging others who could be going through the same challenges we are? What if? Instead of seeing labels, we saw people who are struggling and could be there for them so they didn't feel so alone. What if we looked past our fear of mental health and started to talk about it in a constructive way? What if, as a society, we used empowering words and healthy images to help people feel supported? Maybe then more of us could feel comfortable telling others when we're having a hard time. Maybe more people would get the help they need. And maybe one day we won't have to talk separately about mental health and physical health, but just health. The truth is, each of us has the power to change our culture. Will you join us? Share this video with a kid, your neighbor, 
a friend, and help us break the stigma of mental health. All right. So that's the big question for this advisory council for our students. Um, I need your help breaking the stigma um, throughout Kentucky. Um, so let me know in the chat box, um, what can we do together to help fight the stigma? Go ahead and raise your hands or um, just you can, yeah. if you can't raise your hands, you can go ahead and just say your name and start speaking. Absolutely. Thank you, Tony. Sophie. So one thing that I think is really important is kind of changing the way that we just talk in general and using language that promotes more self-expression and promotes talking to people and asking them how they feel rather than saying things that cause people to bottle things up and like, oh, toughen up and things like that yeah. and try, trying to just change the language and how we talk in general. Yeah, that's so good, Sophie. Thank you. What else? Um, my name's Viviana. Um, I don't have the raise hand feature, so You're I fine. just You're fine. popped in. But um, at my school specifically, the way we kind of go about mental health is sort of using um, expressions like um, just like be happy and kind of those things that make it look to other students or people in general that mental health issues are a choice or brought about ourselves. Like it's your when you use expressions like, you know, just be happy, just do this, if I tell them, I feel like if we went about that a little bit differently, um, then the general population would kind of get what mental health really sort of like are caused by instead of making, we're bringing it upon ourselves. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I don't have the, it's, I'm Gracie. I don't have the um, raise my hand feature either. Um. <laughs> but I, um, I think another thing is that I hear a lot of people joke about mental health quite often. And every year we kind of have a mental health kind of presentation, but we usually only talk about one type of like we usually just talk about something like depression and that's not the only mental health issue you can have and i know i i agree with that yeah and or anxiety and those are not the only types of mental health conditions there are and i know sometimes people who are struggling with their mental health don't have any conditions at all and i think we should be able to talk about that instead of everyone just assuming that they're having a bad day that they huh. are automatically depressed because I hear a lot of people misuse that very often. That's a great point. Thank you, Gracie. Let's go one one more and then we'll uh, then we'll move on. Um, hi, I'm Jack Johnson, and I think another thing that we could uh, improve on is teachers either being not personal enough or vice versa being too personal. Um, I see a lot of teachers that are either completely distant from their students and we see them strictly as a superior um, and nothing else. Like you, you, it's hard to ha talk about that with uh, teachers. Um, also, you also see it flip uh, with teachers that either take on have some of the students' burdens and it affects the way that they work. And I, I don't think that that is the way they should be handled. So I think uh, communicating with teachers and the proper way to do that uh, would be very beneficial. Yeah, those are great points, Jack. Um, thank you. We're going to actually talk about how vicarious trauma. Um, so when teachers are constantly hearing like really, really difficult stories, um, specifically about trauma, there are times when they can literally um, feel that burden so much that it's almost like they are also they are enduring that same trauma. Um, in that household with that student. Um, so that's how heavy that burden can be. Um, so it's not e exactly something that you can just turn off, but um, but certainly helping helping educators through that, helping them un identify that and understand that it's gonna be important. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. 
All right, so thank you very much for those comments. Um, I agreed with our first um, with our first student um, that we've got to be strength based, right? So we've got to encourage um, we've got to encourage our friends, we've got to encourage our our teachers, uh, we've got to encourage our districts to have open conversations about this, right? Um, and these don't always have to be deficit based, so it doesn't have to be, you know, um, only talking about suicide, for instance. We're only talking about the number of kids that um, that are going through a mental health issue, but um, just totally normalizing mental health and encouraging people to have those really uh, courageous conversations. We should be hope dealers, right? So we should provide hope to kids um, that are going through it and and say, you know, I I I don't really. Maybe I can't completely understand exactly what you're going through, um, but my hope for you is that there's going to be a brighter day and I'm going to be with you to help you see that brighter day. And then be upstanders, upstanders. So um, this is when you see somebody making fun of somebody else or, or um, being really passive about somebody that's bringing up a really difficult issue. So maybe somebody is saying, you know, I'm really struggling with my anxiety about going back to school. or I'm really struggling with my mental health. And somebody says things like, oh, you know, as, as our student commented earlier, oh, just toughen up or, you know, um, you're being whatever, uh, being upstander. So when you say when you see something, we have to say something, right? OK, so I want to talk to you a little bit about social and emotional health. So um, within the context of one's family, community and cultural background, social and emotional health is a youth, develop a youth developing capacity to form secure relationships, um, experience and regulate emotions. More on that in just a second and then explore and learn. So then look at this. Um, so students who are be better able to understand and manage their emotions effectively, a skill known as emotional intelligence, do better at school than their less skilled peers. Um, this was measured by thousands and thousands of um, analyses on different um, research projects. OK, so then we go to this idea of social and emotional learning. Um, we had somebody say that you know some teachers are really good at connecting with their students and other teachers are um, really distant and may not connect with their kids. Um, but I submit to you and this is something that the agency is really pushing is that all all teachers um, should be teaching social and emotional learning. They should be teaching that emotional intelligence we just spoke about. So with SEL, um, there are five components. We're not going to be able to get in, as in depth as I'd like to on all five components, but um, we need our students to learn how to self manage, right? Man manage those emotions and behaviors to achieve their goals. We need them to be become self aware and recognize their emotions and values as well as um, their strengths and challenges. We need them to be able to make uh, responsible decisions, um, have relationship skills to so be able to form positive relationships, work in teams, deal effectively with conflict and then have that social awareness, which is shown understanding and empathy for others. Um, we must also teach confidence and resilience. It's going to take a lot of resilience um, to overcome some of the burdens of this year, right? Um, so just like this tree is blowing in the middle of a hurricane, we might we might bend, um, but we've got to really teach people how to overcome um, some of those issues so that they don't break. Um, OK, so students may need help with their mental health. Um, so when we know students have been exposed to trauma or maybe struggling with their mental health, we've got to figure out how we can help. My slides want to go slow today. Um, so we've got to do some of the things that you guys already mentioned, right? We've got to um, listen non judgmentally. We've got to give reassurance and information. So it can't just be like, hey, I've got you. I'm here for you. We've also got to give information. I've got you. I'm here for you. And I think we need to talk to this trusted adult. Um, so we've got to also encourage appropriate professional help. And then we've got to encourage self help and other support strategies. We've also got to, we've got to, also got to do these um, things. We've got to make sure that we're looking and observing, especially um, in our schools, um, in our virtual settings, in our classrooms. We've got to figure out um, what basic necessities and practical needs there are, what psychosocial needs there are, and then what academic needs for students and professional uh, supports for staff there is available. 
We've also got to ask and listen. So we've got to do this with students at all levels. Um, we've got to make sure that we're talking to families through outreach and offering services. We're also, we've also got to make sure that we're listening um, and asking questions to our staff in formal and informal ways. And then we're linking. Um, so when we know that somebody's got a really serious uh, mental health issue, we've got to make sure that we're linking them to those appropriate um, community-based resources so they can get that tier three help that they need. All right, I'm gonna show you one last um, one video real quick. This is about 30, 40 seconds. All right, we'll have to skip it. I'm going to address um, some of the things that they talk about in this anyway. Those are just some warning signs that we might see in our peers. Uh, we also might um, realize that our, our peers are experiencing different feelings like they're desperate or worth, they feel worthless or angry or lonely, um, guilty, sad, worthless or, or hopeless. Um, we've seen this in schools. Um, students might start giving away possessions, which is a, um, a really big sign that they might be considering um, suicide as well. Um, they may be uh, uh, withdrawing, um, abusing or using substances. They might ha um, be participating in reckless behavior, having extreme mood swings, um, increased impulsivity, and um, potentially even self-injuring. Um, they could have a lack of interest in appearance, changes in appetite and weight, changes in sleep patterns, and then thoughts like, all of my problems will end soon. I just can't take it anymore. I wish I were dead. You'll be better off without me, and I can't do anything right. Um, so we've got to start thinking about um, how we can kind of decode warning signs and make sure that our peers know about this information along with our educators as well. So obvious, obvious things that we can look out for is when people say things like, I wish I was dead and I'm going to end it all or I'm going to kill myself, but less direct clues might include things like life's just too hard or you'd be better off without me or what's the point? Okay, so when we see those last direct clues, we've got to start asking deeper questions and um, potentially linking to those trusted adults that we've, at, we've, we've spoken about. Um, in the past, people have hesitated to ask for help because of this. Maybe they're unwilling to admit needing help, they're afraid to upset or anger others, unable to describe their feelings or needs, um, they're unsure of available help or resources, or struggling with symptoms of depression, or they don't know what to expect. They could also, um, be feeling shame or that fear of stigma. Um, some people hesitate to help because they're not sure about how severe the risk is or what if they're wrong, so they don't want to disrupt a relationship. Um, they could be worried about doing or saying the right thing, feelings of inadequacy, afraid to put the idea in someone's head, which is a common uh, misconception. Feel they, they could feel it's not their issue. And then there's this thing called the bystander effect, which is um, which occurs when the presence of others discourages an individual from intervening in an emergency situation against a bully or during an assault or other crime. Um, we've got to remind, we've got to remind people in our schools and in our communities that it's okay not to be, uh, to not be okay. All right, so we all experience stress and at times this stress can be extraordinarily overwhelming. So we've got to also consider the people or things that influence us. Um, is there someone who can help first off? So we've all heard of that school counselor, that incredible teacher that really connects with their kids or um, that family youth service center person or that um, coach or assistant principal or other adult who can help. Um, students should remind their friends that there are trustworthy adults that can help them when they're feeling down. All right, so this is a touchy subject, um, but let's be honest. I, I asked you already to be open and, and honest and vulnerable, but um, are cell phones helping or hurting our mental health? It's a question that we should be asking um, our peers. 
right? I gave a similar presentation at one of the high schools um, in Kentucky, and when, when we started talking about this, some of the kids said, man, I was up till two o'clock in the morning last night on my phone, just, sur just surfing social media. So first off, no, I'm not gonna lecture you, I promise. Um, but we do need to we do need to be honest, right? We've got to figure out what value social media brings to our lives and relationships. What are the pros and the cons? And then how will this affect um, your classmates? So in the chat box, what should students do when they see something concerning on social media? Go ahead and put that on the chat box. So it's it's really late at night. Um, and you come across one of your friends that might say something really concerning to you, what do you think a student should do in that situation? Yes. Okay, so I'm also an adjunct professor and I, I ask my students this, I, I work, I teach um, future counselors and I ask them this question, but then I always give them a curveball. So what if it's, what if it's 11 or 12 o'clock at night and maybe you don't have that trusted adult available? So we've got to, we've got to think about different scenarios and we've got to make sure that, um, that our students are equipped with answers to those different scenarios, um, and along with our teachers. It was not uncommon in my school um, for me to get a text from, I could, I don't know how you guys do it, but sometimes students would find a way to get my, my phone number and they would text me and say, hey, this kid just posted this on social media and really worried about them and it might be 11 o'clock at night. Um, or I might get a teacher that said, hey, I'm, I'm laying in bed and um, just remember, just thinking about my day and remembering what the student said in first or second period and I just thought you should know. Um, so we've got to, we've got to have answers to these really difficult questions. All right, so I see you chiming in. Um, thank you for your thank you for your comments in the chat box. Yes, G Smith. Yeah, I appreciate both of your comments about this. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, um, this may be a student talking about wanting to leave this earth, or another student being bullied. There are many possibilities, um, but we've got to make sure that we. Um, we know how to respond, right? And we um, we even come we even should come up with protocols, really, um, in our schools and districts for this. Each district and school may treat this a little bit different. Okay. We also need to start thinking about what we can do um, to provide provide hope or to be upstanders. So, you and I both know that kids can be kind of mean. People in general, adults, can be kind of mean on social media when they don't prefer the way that somebody posted something, right? Um, so when somebody is being mean, I want to know how you can be an upstander. How can? What are you going to say, right, to kind of end that ugliness? Go ahead and put that in the chat box as well. While you're doing that, I'm going to finish up. So I want you to keep in mind um, that on average, American consumers now check their smartphones an average of 52 times each day, okay? Um, we spend almost three hours, about three hours and 15 minutes a day on our phones. I don't think that's healthy, right? I think that we need to talk to one another again. I think that we need to um, find ways to interact. I think we need to get outside. Um, and we just need to have, be willing to have these conversations with our peers that say, hey, I, I know that you're spending a lot of time on your phone. Um, the moment we wake up, the first thing we do is check our phone and our social media. Um, I know that many kids and many adults are checking their phones during the school day. Um, in the evenings and then that's probably the last thing that they do before they shut their eyes to sleep okay so we need to um, we need to consider those things as well social media isn't always bad though um, there are positive ways that we are affected by our devices and our or social media so there's some really great things that can can happen um, again we can be lifted up you don't have to put this in the chat box but we can be lifted up we can lift other people up we can encourage we can be help dealers like we talked about earlier today 
All right, so final thought um, is that we all do our best and suffering with mental health is not something our children have to do alone. Um, so we have this incredible opportunity um, that to get help, right? So there's the suicide prevention hotline so people can call and they'll get um, a live responder on that call if they just need some help. And then there's this really kid, kid friendly option, which is a text line. Right. So if somebody's really, um, really, really concerned about their own mental health, they can even pick up their phone and text this crisis text line. And um, even in Kentucky, we've seen incredible um, rates of kids and people getting help through our state by using both of these resources. All right, so the big question, so I presented a lot of information very fast and I'm going to finish up with talking about teachers in a second, but the big question is, um, I want you guys to stand up and speak out. You may not realize it, but you are leaders in your schools and you're truly leaders in your communities. So I want to know, and this again, this is the big question, and this is an ongoing question for all of us uh, because I plan to be with you throughout the year. In what ways can this advisory group raise mental health awareness in Kentucky? So in what ways can we put something together that's going to help other, other people? Okay. So be thinking about that and then what project can we do collaboratively? If you have ideas, go ahead and throw them in the chat box um, and again, we'll follow up on those. All right now um, we don't have time, obviously, but I normally I always love to play music. Um, so there's this great song called um, I'll Find You is by Tori Kelly and it features Lecrae um, and it's just a really fun song, but it it talks about how we can really be there for somebody that um, that is struggling. All right, we do love our teachers in Kentucky. Um, so I want to I wanted to give you a few um, things that our teachers need to know um, and that you can kind of help them realize. OK, um, so first off, compassion and resilience. This is this is this ability to maintain our physical, emotional and mental well-being um, while compassionately identifying and addressing and addressing the stressors that are barriers to learning for students. Um, we identify and address the barriers to caregivers and parents and colleagues being able to effectively partner on behalf of children. And then we identify, prevent and minimize compassion fatigue within ourselves. So that's what compassion resilience is, is, is knowing that there's a lot going on with the people that we care for and, and love, um, but also being able to maintain our own mental health while doing so. Um, Instead of this feeling of like, I can't do this, I can't do it. Um, we're really going to be resilient and say, I can do this, I can do it. Um, so we've got to think of this resilience as a reservoir of well-being that we can draw upon on difficult days and in difficult situations. Um, it's this dynamic process or outcome that is the result of interaction over time between a person and their environment. Um, and re resilient teachers tend to maintain jobs out of satisfaction and commitment to their profession. So I want to finish up with this idea of secondary trauma, which many of your teachers experience, many of your educators experience, um, uh, certainly many of your school counselors experience. So this is when staff that work with students who experience traumatic events are often deeply affected. This is what I talked about earlier. Um, while it is uncommon, some helpers experience some of the same symptoms of trauma as if the experience had happened to them. And then look at this. So this is kind of a solution that I think we should promote in all of our schools and all of our districts. Um, it's also the school's responsibility to understand that trauma is inevitable and can impact anyone. If we want healthy teachers in our classrooms, schools must acknowledge the importance of things like staff appreciation, involvement in decision making, vacation time, mental health awareness, and professional development training on ways to build and value self care. It's critical that these efforts are school or district wide because an inordinate emphasis on self-care or resilience without adequate supports places too much of the burden on the individual edu educator. So basically uh, your teachers care so much about you and love you so much that they often forget to take care of themselves and love themselves so much. Um, so it's our job to remind them of that and show them um, that we need them and we need them to be um, to be healthy and mentally well. Um, so I'll finish with a, just just this idea. I wanted to share with you some really cool things that are happening in Kentucky. Um, so um, Dr. Foster uh, and David and Tony have mentioned that we've we've put this uh, different guidance documents together and we put 
together this document um, titled Considerations for Reopening Schools Supporting Student and Staff Wellness. So our schools should be prepared to help um, ensure that our students and staff feel um, feel that their mental health is important and addressed. Um, we've also put together this really cool um, document. I'm so proud of this. It's it's called Guidance on How Districts Can Facilitate Conversations About Race-Based Stress and Trauma. Um, so uh, again, something I'm super proud of. Um, we heard from the, the, the advisory last year that it felt like when the pandemic hit, everybody forgot about our kids' futures, and they were just trying to figure out how do we instruct, how do we instruct. Um, so we know that your futures and, and the idea of post-secondary education is important, or post-secondary careers is important. So we've created these ILP playbooks that offer um, educators different ways to connect social emotional learning and connect lessons to, to um, to how you think about your futures and how you figure out who you are as a person and who you want to be. Um, we've also created this summer this partnership. We've had we have this partnership with KET. Um, so we're about to release the suicide prevention program. So all schools in Kentucky can um, do this new suicide prevention program. It's engaging. We have students that actually talk on the on this lesson um, and give advice to other students. So we're really proud of that. And then we've also created a professional development on mental health um, for all educators in our state through KET as well. So that's all I have. Um, I appreciate you engaging with me today. You can find me here if you want to, um, to talk about how we can collaborate on mental health. You can also follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Damian. We really appreciate your presentation. Um, and students, I just want to let you know that you will be receiving um, an email here. I'm going to put the exit form in the chat here in just a minute. And we do collect, um, we do notes from these meetings so that you're able to go back and we capture your comments and do a collaboration of uh, things that were said to kind of capture and, and take meeting notes. Um, so I will put the exit form in here. This is just a, a, another way for you to share feedback with us here at the department. Um, I have a couple of other things I want to bring up. Um, I want to share my screen for a minute because I do have some exciting news that I want to share um, that this is going to particularly um, involve our sophomores and juniors. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. OK, so this right here is uh, an executive order that was signed by the governor on July 21st. So it was signed last week. Um, and what this does is he has added a student representative to the Kentucky Board of Education. Um, this is the first time that a student representative will serve on the Kentucky Board of Education. And where this it also uh, confirms the teacher and we have a teacher. Her name is Allison Sloan. Um, she is from Rowan County um, that is already serving on the board. This is an ex officio member, so that means it's a non voting member. Um, but you uh, the student is a, an actual member of the Board of Education. You receive the same information and you sit at the table with everyone else. Um, that is at the Board of Education. The other ex officio members of the board include our CPE president, Dr. Aaron Thompson, um, our Lieutenant Governor uh, Jacqueline Coleman as secretary of the Education uh, Workforce Development Cabinet. Those are our other ex officio members of the board. So as you can see, very important member uh, members. And so this is how um, we're going to work at the department. Um, he says right here that the student representative will be appointed uh, by the governor from the Commissioner's Student Advisory Council uh, through a process that we are creating right now um, through the commissioner's office. So I'm working on that. What we know right now is that it's going to be a two year commitment. So that is why um, it's going to have to be a sophomore or a junior that's on the council. So what I want you to do is just think about this. This would be an additional commitment uh, for you in addition to serving on this uh, council. Uh, if you are interested in this, we'll talk about this again. I just wanted to bring it up for you today to let you know. 
Um, we think it's very, very exciting um, that the governor and that our state board of education uh, is, is, is excited or is looking to add a student voice to the state board of education. Uh, we think it's a very, a very important step. And Kevin, did you want to add anything to that? I think you covered it, Tony. Uh, this is an honor, but it's also uh, uh, necessary and it's an important step. Uh, and uh, today's call is just a perfect example of the insight you all will be able to provide your, your representative that will be chosen from this group. Uh, and then that, there'll be a feedback loop. The, the person that will be on the board uh, from this group will obviously take information and uh, feedback and uh, from uh, the advisory and to the state board and then we'll be bringing back information from the state board back into this group um, but uh, I was uh, Tony and I have been texting over the last few minutes uh, this may be one of the best advisory uh, meetings that I have witnessed uh, since March uh, because of the level of detail involvement everyone participated you all have something to add you're going deep uh, you're bringing up things that, uh, and um, nuance that we've not thought of. That's exactly why we have you. I'm actually going to use you in this meeting as an example for the other advisories uh, of the teachers, superintendents, principals, etc. When I'm not getting the t that same type of feedback and we sometimes have uh, meetings where it, we have crickets and so uh, that's not the case here. So I want to compliment you on that. Um, and uh, Dr. Glass had to drop off because he had he's obviously running a school a very large school district right now and getting ready to run a state agency so but uh, he is uh, very lucky to have you uh, as part of his advisory and I just want to thank you all for your participation I'm very impressed and um, but not surprised uh, because I just know the type of students we have in Kentucky so thank you yeah, very, very. Um, I'm just very excited. I knew I was. I knew that we were. I was. I've been pumped for this meeting for a, a long time. I know that I talked with many of you all during the process and interviewing, especially our new ones. I knew our old ones coming back, and I don't want to call you all old, but um, our veterans coming back were going to be wonderful. Um, but I'm very, very excited. And and as I mentioned to you all, you know, we're kind of taking this uh, this council in a new direction. Um, in terms of meeting more often and because we're able to do this virtually um, to have more student voice and so we're very excited about that and I think the sky is the limit um, you know and I think I told you too that you know gosh you think it's a two-hour meeting but it flies by it goes by really quickly um, and you know that might be something that we you know we look at to keep our, our agendas low um, and to make sure we have more time because I don't want you to feel that you know the time flew by and that you didn't have a chance to, to have your voice heard because we, we know your time is valuable and we want to make sure that that uh, that there's enough time. So these are all things that we want your feedback on. So um, you know Donna and myself um, and Raphael, I know that you've talked to Raphael a few times. Um, you know, let us know what worked today, what didn't work today. Uh, we'll make some adjustments, um, but I am so incredibly proud of every one of you. Um, I feel like a proud mama over here. Um, you all did so great. Um, and our next meeting is going to be August 11th. There was a typo on the agenda that went out, the paper agenda. I think on your email it's correct, um, but it'll be August 11th. Um, it's also on your exit form. And if any of you all, we have a few minutes left. If you all want some closing comments, does anybody want to raise their hand with some uh, some last minute observations or or things that we can we can go on and learn for today? Tony, I'll just add that um, just know you you are a part of the uh, commissioner's advisory uh, all the time, whether or not we're having a meeting or not. Uh, know that the comments you put in the chat feature, as well as the comments that you'll put in the exit slip. Uh, we take those the same as if you were raising your hand and um, speaking uh, on uh, during the meeting. And so if there's an issue that comes up uh, between now and the next meeting and you think that the commissioner needs to know about it or you have some insight, feel free to email Tony 
uh, and uh, and get and we will you know we're going to consider that you're part of the advisory uh, team so uh, just know that your voice is important and we need to hear that even in between the advisory uh, meetings absolutely you are a direct link um, you're our direct link to to uh, your schools to your communities um and to your to your friends and to your uh, classmates in your districts so just keep that in mind you're a very very important uh piece to our puzzle here um particularly now with the with the pandemic but always you know we hope that things get back to number uh, back to normal uh quickly um but uh we're excited to have you to have you with us and to have your voice um so does anybody want to close us out now that we've talked about how great you all are. <laughs> all right. Um, I think that we will. Did you can someone click on that exit form for me just to make sure that you can get into that? Sometimes I put a um, I put sometimes you can't get into it outside of KDE. I just want to make sure that you can click on it and that you're able to access it. And if you can just put OK or something. Perfect. Thank you, Soyana. Uh, and if you guys can get those filled out for me, that would be great. Um, and you thank you all. You all are awesome. Um, and just let me know how we can we can work. Um, oh, I did want to tell you that um, I do want to work with you all. If you are comfortable, it is in this in the uh, in the exit form. We would love to have your participation on the masking campaign. So um, please, if you're interested in sharing um, why you're why you're wearing a mask and who you're wearing a mask for, um, let me know and put that information in the form. We're working with one of our um, with one of our cooperatives that's been doing great videos. Uh, that actually one of them was featured on the governor's press conference yesterday with Miss Kentucky. Um, so I'd love to to work with you all on that. I think that that would be great. So. All right, it's 1157. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, you will think be Caleb here. has his hand up. Oh, yep. Caleb does have his hand yeah. up. Thank you. Right. Oh, hey, uh, before we head out, I just wanted to say that, um, I, you know, I've been thinking today, like throughout the discussions that we've had, and I think it's important for us to remember as we move forward at um, what works in the school district in one school, what works in, you know, for one individual when it comes to mental health. Uh, may not work for another one. So I think it's important for us to try to look at ways to address the needs of all um, Kentucky schools, all Kentucky students, um, especially given that, you know, here from a, from the perspective of a rural student, I know that the issues that I face, the issues that my classmates face may be different from that of an individual that's in an urban area. Um, you know, especially in regard to infrastructure. Uh, I know that, I believe Peyton had mentioned that um, why that's not the best in his region, uh, his area. It's the same here. Um, and I think that's an issue that we all face, but particularly here in Eastern Kentucky. Um, I just wanted to add that to the discussion. Thank you all. Sure. Did you Thanks. mention, did you say Wi-Fi? You broke out there for a minute. Um, yeah, I said Wi-Fi or, you know, our Wi-Fi here um, is not the best. <laughs> Given that I have the, um, one of the, you know, one of the best plans around, I still have issues trying to connect from time to time. Um, no, absolutely. Does anybody else want to add in on that one? Perfect. I'll just, uh, I, as Tony, as you know, I like to point out interesting things and in, in, uh, backdrops as we do these uh, Microsoft Teams meetings. So shout out to Cade in your taste in music. You have Johnny Cash, Elvis, and I believe Reba that I could see. Great, great albums. Perfect. Everybody have all a great right. week. Weekend. Thank you all very much. It was great to meet all of you. And thank you to our interpreters from the Kentucky School for the Deaf. Uh, we look forward to working with you next time. And we will see you on August 11th. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.